Hi, this will be a film on the issue of key bedding at the piano. What does that mean? Why is it so important? And how can we solve the problem? So the piano key is blocked by what we call the key bed when it gets to the bottom. Key bedding, however, this refers to sending the key into the key bed with too much force, thus causing an impact on the landing. Or especially to push the key into the key bed after producing the sound and deliver this unnecessary force whilst keeping the key depressed. Now it's a huge issue. I would say most pianists will have at least some room to improve on this. Even some professional players have room to be a little more efficient. And basically if we're constantly digging in really hard, we're going to work the hand unnecessarily. It can get extremely strenuous. And functionally speaking as well, we've got to be free to travel from side to side. If we're constantly bearing down with the arm on single events, it's going to have a massive impact on the ability to move around with lightness and ease. So if you ever feel sluggish when you play, this is almost certainly the factor that you have to address. Now what I'm going to show shortly is two very common explanations of how to improve on the issue, which for me, I don't believe they're actually that effective, to be honest. They can help on the surface, but I don't think they really get to the heart of the underlying issues. For me, I'd summarise the mistake they make by treating it as if, when you move a key, it's a bit like we just had a dial, as if we turn up this dial of intensity to make the finger go into the key. And then once the key is finished moving, as if we just have to remember, turn that dial back down again, and supposedly problem solved. What I'm going to show you is a very different way of thinking, where we're going to be extremely positive about the way we interact with the keybirds. We're not going to use this drastic, unnecessary pressure, but what we do put in is going to be extremely intentional. And I'll show you how this can actually make for greater freedom than working with a sense of caution or any kind of fearful sense of the keybirds. OK, I'm going to use a Chopin prelude to make some demonstrations. So first, this is what key bedding might look like in the context of chords. So you can see both the impact as I land and the sense of digging in, piling everything on after the keys have gone down. Completely unnecessary. Now, I'll first show you the idea that if we relax after we get to the key bed, some people say that this is the solution to key bedding. Now, what I'm going to demonstrate, I don't want to argue this will always turn out this way for anyone who uses this premise. But what I'll say is that if the only thing we attend to is the relaxation after the key bed, at the very least, it could turn out something like this. I'll give you a demonstration of what I would do personally. I won't go too deep into the explanation yet. In the last few minutes of the video, I'll show you how this is done. But for now, we'll just talk largely about the differences between these. I'm sure you can see that I'm certainly not holding back from the keybirds, I'm using them, there's no doubt about it. I'll explain again in the last few minutes why I can do this in such a way that's safe. But compared to the other one, where we had that kind of judder and that kind of nothingness, there's much more consistency in the version I go for. It's not this kind of wild shock into the keybird and then down to nothing. As I said before, that idea of the dial, the hit the key beds then relax. If we, if we say only the relaxation afterwards matters, we might hit them with way too much force, as if we've turned that dial up really sharply, and then we've suddenly flipped it back the other way, all the way down to nothing. And to be honest, at neither end of that dial is good, neither the big spike to the high force, or the instant release to almost nothing. It's actually better to keep a focus on the hand. I'll just show you why I think that way. If I have the judder, then relax. My body doesn't really feel joined when I relax, it actually goes too far, so I have too much of an impact. And now my hand feels like it's gone asleep, there's no real connection through the piano. If I keep a focus on my hand, I feel a kind of physical relationship to the next chord. So 
the relaxation, effectively, it's almost as if I did this. Now, if you focus incredibly hard, maybe it's possible to still sound acceptable whilst doing that. But of course, it's much easier when we feel physical relationships than if we go kind of stick the switch all the way down to nothing. It's so much easier just to maintain something that's manageable than have this wild spike to a big peak and then take it down to zero. Now, uh, what that one does achieve is the second type of key bedding, this digging in. It relieves that. But the big problem is hitting the key bed itself, it doesn't do anything about that whatsoever. So compare it to this, if I punch the piano as hard as I can and then relax afterwards, I've not really done anything very helpful to save my knuckles. Now, if I punched it and did this, then, OK, why would I not relax after, by all means? But still, why have you got the impact in the first place? You can't say that impact doesn't matter as long as you relax afterwards. Anyway, so uh, let's move on to the second category now. The second explanation is a little bit different. So this one does try to deal with how we contact the keybeds in the first place. The explanation that's sometimes given is that between the key sending the hammer free and landing into the keybed, there's a point called the escapement, basically. And escapement is slightly before the keybed. So the theory is that we can basically relax the pressure slightly before the key lands into the keybed. And the theory is that that's supposed to stop the impact as we get there. Now, the obvious thing, if I play very loudly, the idea I can somehow time that to this tiny, minuscule distance and somehow slow the key down before that happens. Of course, that's absolutely ludicrous. That, that doesn't explain anything. But this is particularly harmful if we fall into the trap of thinking this way whilst playing very quietly. It's absolutely ruinous to our control over the sound. And it's one of the most common mistakes people make whilst playing quiet chords. So I'll just show you what could happen if I was trying to hold back before finishing the movement into the keyboard whilst playing quiet chords. It could turn out something like this. So the first thing, again, that physical disconnect from what I'm doing, it's even worse. If I play like I'm fearful of the keybeds, I can't bond between my body and the hands through the piano. There's this sense everything is kind of held in the middle through the sense of restriction. So we really have to be sure that we actually play through the keys. We can't possibly try to time it. In the real world, there's no chance of this happening. We have to play through. For precision in quiet chords, think of a slow movement that takes the key into the key bed intentionally. I'll explain in the last couple of minutes how to do this safely, but uh, essentially anything that holds back is going to be unpredictable. And the analogy I would use here is golfers. If you watch a golfer putting, they'll always go slowly but straight through the ball. You'll never see a professional golfer who putts at the ball and then tries to slow down. But you'll see a great many amateur golfers that make this mistake. They go to the ball, it's like they're scared of it. And anything can happen. They put in too much energy and try and slow it down before it reaches the ball. The ball can go way, way too far, or they can slow down so much they don't even get to the ball in the first place. It's very much the same on the piano. If we want to control our sound when we play softly, we have to play through the escapement and actively into the keyboard. Right, so let's look deeply into what you do need to do. First, let's go back to what key bedding was and go with a slightly deeper explanation of what's really going on. So if it looks like this. I'm jammed, I've got nowhere to go. Remember that the conventional idea treats it as if we've turned up the dial, the only thing we can do is turn that dial back down again. But of course, the reality is it's much more sophisticated. We don't have a four straight into the key that's more or less. We have directions of forces, and this is what's so important. I'll show you a more exaggerated version of what key bedding could also look like, would be something like this, where everything piles straight into the direction of the key. In this case, my body is either held back or I'm blocking my body as well. But the most extreme version 
is if we pile even more in still. So I'll give you a slightly ridiculous exaggeration, although to be honest I've seen some people play almost like this. If I were to play some Rachmaninoff, taking the key bedding, uh, the, the kind of deeper key bedding to the extreme, it might look like this. <laughs> Whereas the way I would certainly play it myself would look more like this. And that's based on considering directions of forces. I'll show you just how simple this can actually be very shortly. But essentially, uh, yeah, it's just pushing itself away, really. That's pretty much all we have to understand. If the body is locked and we only move the arms, that may jam. Or if the body piles in, that actually jams even harder. Although I'm sending loads of energy in through the mass, it doesn't land into the hand very efficiently at all. Most of the energy actually hits as an aftershock into the keybed. So that's exactly what keybedding really is. This kind of extra piling of energy in the direction of the keys. When I do this, Actually, I'll give you an exaggerated version first. The worst thing I can possibly do is maybe fall off the piano stool if I go too far with that, but I'm not sending energy into the keyboard. I'm using the keyboard as a platform to send energy elsewhere. Now, one other version of this, which is also a possibility that I should at least acknowledge, if I push forwards and over, it's a very similar concept the energy has somewhere else to go. So the keyboard can help to push the wrists, sorry, the key bed can help to push the wrists up. I would caution against using that one too exclusively, because actually myself, I have a very bad habit of doing this way, way too much. So I actually have to work really hard at reducing that one. It does take you into freedom, but it takes you into position that's unsustainable. Whereas if you push yourself away, you can be in a very conventional middle of the rolled hand position, and you don't run out of anything. That's just great as it is, you can carry on from there, whereas this one, too much dependence on that can be rather limiting. So I would never say don't push the wrists forward to anybody, but I would stress very strongly, you should definitely learn to actually repel your body back and out of the keyboards. In this fashion. So I'll show you a reduced, but still sort of realistic version. It could look something like this. wouldn't be unreasonable to play for real that way. Although, of course, the more we get used to this, the more we can balance things out. So it's like we're starting a little bit inward, just ever so slightly, and chiefly using that tiny bit of leaning as a stabiliser, so we don't need to do this every single time. That's one way of practising to get used to the idea. But just that very little bit of leaning in can stabilise against the forces in that direction. And we're not really jammed into the keys. As I said, if you go in too much, or if you go straight down with the hands, there's a real jamming back there. As long as the body is at least a little bit responsive to this, you can't really jam in the hands. That's completely free, so I have somewhere to go. So even, I'll be very concise now, it could look like this. So essentially the mass of the body is functioning as not, not as an accelerator, but more as kind of an absorber of the responses. You can look at it actually, that there's, uh, there's videos I've seen of old uh, cannons back in World War II where it gets knocked backwards. I think they have loads of sandbags that catch the impact. Another way of looking at it, you can imagine if someone were to fire a rifle if they had it resting against their shoulder, you get the recoil comes back into the shoulder. As long as we're willing to accept this response to what we put into the keybeds, as long as we don't kind of fight too hard against it, we let it come back in just very gently, the mass we have in our body is going to absorb that effortlessly. It's not going to jam up in a big way. It's just going to be taken into the body in this kind of straightforward fashion. So you'll hardly see anything happening, but you have to understand in order to learn how to do this, that your body has to be a receiver. It's not held back, well, just the arms move like this. Neither is it hugely resting inward ridiculously. It's just a very small lean that you then try and push back out of. Slow. 
slight exaggeration at first, getting smaller. And as long as you felt the concept, your body becomes this effortless absorber. Now, just a final exercise to help get that feeling. The comparison which is best for this is that of a press-up, essentially. Now, this exercise, this is not a strength exercise, I've got to stress. It's just for coordination. But if you lean in, you've got to keep pushing yourself back as you go in. Don't lean your full body weight in when you do this, but just lean some of it into the hands. And this is where, when you go inwards, this is where your hands have to be the most active, actually. Because if you don't push back as you lean inwards, then we've got that kind of slump again. Like our key bedding, we slump too hard into the hands if we just let go. So we've got to keep pushing the body back as it gently leans in, and that's what keeps us free. And then the really important one, when we push it right back again, when we're going this way, we've got to carry on leaning in a little bit. We don't want to come back too easily, so we've got to slightly resist that. But we don't want to work the hands unnecessarily hard either. But essentially, when you're going in this direction, the more you push yourself back away, the more free you become. Whereas in this direction, the more you relax into that, the more you have to work hard to maintain the balance, which is quite counterintuitive. But if you, if you imagine if you were literally doing a real press up, the gravity would be taking you in and this would be the hardest position to sustain without falling down. It's when you push back out again, the muscles are contracting to get you back out. But the more you get back out, the less effort that balance is. That's when it becomes easy. So this is how we actually avoid keep bedding. It's not this simple thing, put the force in, remember to turn it off. Nothing like that whatsoever. Deliver the force in such a way that you have somewhere to go and specifically get used to going back out of it like this. Once you can do that in the exaggerated fashion, you can then start to refine it, have that easy simplicity. But we've got to have this kind of connection between the hand and the piano and the shoulder and the shoulder has to feel responsive. If the shoulder goes in that way, we have big problems. It's just connecting them back up, basically. Once you can do that, it can start to like this as well. Next thing you know, you can whack the hell out of the piano, still feel effortless. at all doing that because I'm not compressing inwards I'm always responsive to that so it works absolutely fine just by letting the body absorb essentially 